What's up, everybody? I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came out to the screenings. We had an amazing run. It was a blast. Stay tuned for more announcements in the coming months. We will have more announcements for the movie Left at Wall. It's going to be available to everybody really, really soon. Can't share much more now, but we'll have more soon. But just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came out to the screenings, all the cast and crew, everybody who made this project possible. I'll be saying a lot more in the coming months. But for now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Episode 40, Paul Strickland. Paul Strickland is a storyteller. Actually, he is many things, a comic, producer, actor, puppeteer. But at the end of the day, and more than anything, he's a storyteller. Paul and I first met many years ago on the road comedy circuit. Since then, Paul has morphed his career from stand-up into storytelling. As a storyteller, He's performed at fringe festivals, arts festivals, libraries, and some of the most prestigious storytelling venues domestically and around the world. Please welcome to the show, Paul Strickland. Paul Strickland. So good to see you, man. Good to see you, Ron. It's been a long time. I was just thinking, I mean, it's been, has it been over a decade? No. Uh, okay, it hasn't quite no. been that long. I think maybe it was it was like 15, 2015 or twenty sixteen was that when we we did a um, we did a country club in Kentucky. That's right for Tom Sobel. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tom, and you know, speaking of which, rest in power, Tom. I know. I yeah, know. that was well. sad. Yeah, that was actually you know, and and I actually sort of hinted at that when he passed and everybody was posting on his Facebook um, because that era, that fall, I remember what happened to me. I was supposed to do some tour in the UK and the UK tour fell through. So I had a lot of gaps in my fall schedule and by a lot of gaps, I mean nothing because I thought Mm -hmm. I was going to be in the UK. So I emailed every booker and was just like, I'll take any fallout you got, anything. I just need to at least fill my weekends. Otherwise, I'm going to have a really rough fall. Yeah. And Tom Sobel loaded me up with everything he could. I, I got to, you know, he gave me a lot of work. And he even was trying to help me out because he thought you still lived in Nashville. So he thought we would carpool. He was like, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, he was always doing that. Yeah, he he goes you and you and Paul drive together cuz he lives in Nashville. And I knew at the time you didn't still live in Nashville. Yeah. But I didn't I I just wanted to like book the gig and you know, he he was the type of guy he kept you on the phone for 45 minutes anyway. So yep. you were always I just said, "Yeah, great, man." Yep. <laughs> and then I think that was how he found out you didn't live in Nashville anymore cuz he followed up with me. Yeah. And he was like, "Did you guys drive together?" And I said, "No." And he goes, "Why?" And I was like, "Paul doesn't live in Nashville anymore." Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, a little bit That's of insider so baseball. <laughs> I know. Well, no. And it, what's, what might be even funnier about that story is that I'm trying to remember, but I might have been living in Louisville at that time, which oh, was the funny. same city he lived in. <laughs> yeah. So maybe he and I should have carpooled together. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what made you go from stand up to storytelling? You know, I mean, there's like a long slide way of talking about it, right? And then there's like the short story. The the real, the truth is, I was always kind of searching for a way to fit a square peg into a round hole a little bit, you know? Like my act was never really like a prop, like a normal stand-up act, especially for the kind of road gigs that I was doing, right? Like, so I was always sort of, uh, you know, really playing with the form, And trying to, you know, I mean, uh, my stand-up stuff was there was a fair amount of, like, sort of meta deconstructive awareness of, like, what we're doing here. And I think a lot of times in, like, corporate events or in, like, country club shows, um, the audience isn't, they just don't know that that's an option. Mm -hmm. And so I was having to do a lot of work to kind of pull off those sort of, I guess, literary or theatrical concepts in those places. And uh, I also just wanted to be able to talk about things in kind of a more nuanced way. 
that I just wasn't as good enough a stand up to do that. Other comics can do that, can do, can kind of talk about things in the sort of nuanced way that I was interested in with just jokes. But I just found that it was like an easier path from point B to point C to, uh, to sort of start doing things more narratively and to kind of just really dig in and employ the sort of magical realism and surrealism that I was super interested in anyway. And it really all came about like the slow slide of it came about starting in 2010 because I wanted, I got divorced. That's why I left Nashville. And, um, and I really wanted to talk about my divorce, but I didn't dislike my ex-wife. And there was a really, I had a, enough bits. I mean, they're on a couple of albums I have, but like I had some bits that worked, but to really talk about, what I was feeling, which was this sort of dissonance between how I felt about Becky and how I felt about my divorce to be able to talk about that accurately, uh, in a stand up club setting was very difficult for me. So I started doing it through solo shows and it was like a mix of spoken word and storytelling and, and stand up. And then that kind of morphed into this thing that I do now, which is much more, which is completely fictional storytelling uh, based on my own life. Right. Like, so I'm taking things that are actually happening to me and then I'm writing fictional narratives around that and then presenting that as stories. I mean, it's such a compelling world and one that I've always admired from afar to the point of, uh, and now we're, we're going to get like a little bit of insider road baseball again here, but it but it's sort of applicable. Um, the storytelling center in Jonesboro, mm. Tennessee, yeah. has always just like I, I've always just had so much reverence for that place. Mm. And I, I would always go to Jonesboro. There was that comedy zone in Johnson City. Yeah. And I remember I never got to make this happen really because I only had a couple of years where I could have, but I always wanted to perform at that comedy zone the same weekend of, as the storytelling festival, just so I could go. Mm -hmm. And I even told, I mean, I even told the bookers, I'm like, look, I'll MC if I have to, I just, 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 just give me a room and, and like put a little bit of cash in my pocket so I can just go to this thing. Yeah. Um, but the stars never aligned. And some of it was on my end. Some of it was like my rotation would have been too soon to have me back there. Some of it was I, I just had a more lucrative gig that I could not just pass up just like so yeah. thing. Or like that was when I was doing a lot of colleges. So that was when NACA was in full swing. So it just never aligned. Like like it wasn't on the book because, you know, the Comedy Zone people, they were like, yeah, if you really want to go to this thing so bad, we'll figure out something for you. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a weird request, buddy. But um, but yeah, I never got to go. But I, I have so much. And you've gotten to perform there. Yeah, last year. Last year, I was a featured teller there at the National Storytelling Festival. And actually, next week, I'll be at the Storytelling Center as a teller in residence. As part so how of their, long is that residency? It's one week, but I'm doing five different hours of stories on five days. So thir Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I do a different hour every day. So how is it different doing an hour of storytelling versus an hour of stand up? Like, how do you gauge the success of the show? How do you gauge, um, you know, because obviously with stand up, it's so easy. You just you just kind of know whether your LPM is good or not. And by I don't mean easy in the performance sense. I mean, easy yeah. as in like, well, I know it went well because they laughed where they were supposed to. Uh, but with storytelling, how is that? How is that different? How is yeah. it different for you? I mean, I think, right, like, so with stand-up, it is that thing you're talking about, like, last per minute, and, and like, a, like it's like a combustion engine, right? And so the question is, does it have enough power to push you over the hill? Mm -hmm. And I think, ultimately, the question with storytelling is not what, like, is happening every 15 seconds, but what is happening over the course of the story. And... People are people that really enjoy that style of storytelling. Um, they have an attention span 
and an interest in sort of seeing out a a whole arc. They like want to see the whole thing happen. And so you really can do some, a lot more experimental things in that world uh, for me, at least that's how I've, that's how I feel about it. That's how I have been able to do it is that you can, you can really take the time to set up a concept and then explore that concept. And it doesn't have to be, it has to be entertaining the whole time. You have to be, you have to have a lot of stagecraft and you have to have other tricks other than jokes. Like, you know, you have to be able to like understand what the context is that you're telling the story in. But by the end of a story, 15 minutes later or whatever, I'll know based on the energy in the room, if I've actually connected with enough of the people in the room. And so it is, you know, there, there isn't like that sort of one-to-one immediate response, but you also can see most audiences Mm -hmm. when you're telling stories. And so it's very helpful because you can really tell if they are into it uh, as you're going. And you know, if someone's on their phone, you know, if someone's on their phone and stories uh, also, I mean, I think there is a way in which like that interaction that you can see people, you can change the story a bit as you're telling it every time. Um, because I don't memorize things. Um, it is very jazz like in that way where I know the tune, I know where I'm trying to get back to how I get there is often dependent upon how chaotic the situation is. So sometimes I'll tell a story for 20 people at some private event then that'll be like the donor base of a thing. Well, none of those people are coming to the thing. That's how that often works, right? So then the I'll tell this story for the donors, and then they won't even be coming to the festival or the event. And then I'll go to the festival. I'll tell the same story in a tent that has 800 people, 500 of which are actually paying attention. And so you have to tell the story dramatically differently in those two contexts. And I think that's a lot of what it is, is about sort of stand up. I feel like is very condensed in terms of its artistic endeavor. Like I'm going to make this little machine of a joke and I'm going to craft this little machine and this machine is going to function. And then I'm going to use that to segue into the next machine. And then we, you know, that's how we move through the 45 minutes. But I feel like with storytelling, the machines are all functioning in different ways. So you are moving from machine to machine to machine to machine in my head, but they're not all as complex and dense as a joke. There are all these other sort of tools and methods, physical. I've done a lot of work with like physical comedians, like mimes and things like that. I've done a lot of work with them just to work on having some extra tricks in my bag for, you know, really engaging storytelling audiences. Do you like storytelling better? Yeah, I do. But I think it likes me better too. I mean, it's just a better fit, you know? I really do feel like I mean, stand up's an amazing it's an amazing art form and and there are people that are so great at it and I always felt like I was I always kind of feel like I hit my ceiling which was, you know, top of the middle. I was like a really, really good stand-up, but I didn't, I don't know that I had a lot more room to grow up from there. And I was, you know, I was headlining on the road constantly in, you know, 2016 through 2019, I was like full-time headlining and, um, and was on the road full-time for 10 years, but it just wasn't, it's not this, like what I do now Um, with the magical realist storytelling. And I've also, you know, I tell sometimes for kids now I started doing like children's shows with folk and fairy tales. It's just made me a better performer because, you know, kids don't care at all about how you feel about how they feel. Like there is zero uh, tact involved. If you, if you're not good, they will tell you. And so, you know, so it is, it is, yeah, it has forced me in that way to sort of be a better teller and, and that kind of expansion of both having that amount of material and having such widely ranging audiences has really forced me to sort of hone this thing that I'm doing now 
in a way that I just never had the foresight or ability, I think, to hone my stand-up act. Well, when you say folk and, and folklore, do, are you – or fairy tale and folklore, are you, like, reciting older stories or are these ones that you've written, like, when, when you do well, the kids' shows? It's a combination of the two. I mean, I don't do – I don't, like, read a story somewhere and then say it. You know right, what I mean? Right. No, no. So what, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, like, I'll find a folk tale for whatever reason that really speaks to me in some way. So, a, for example, a story I'm telling in the show that I'm doing here at Orlando Fringe um, is a folk tale, but I'm telling it for adults in a bar setting, right? Mm-hmm. So you can't do you can't just do what is on the page from the 1820s in that setting. People get bored immediately. I, I've literally one time had two people. I said once upon a time in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, I literally said the words once upon a time and two people stood up and walked out of the venue. Wow. That's like, they didn't even let me. Yeah. And the thing is I deconstruct folk tales and then insert myself in the middle. So I'm, I'm doing jokes about the material as I'm doing the material and then I'm getting to a, so I'll get to a part in the folk tale. And then I'll, you know, relate it to the audience in front of me. So I'll stop. I'll literally stop the story. So I'll just give you an example. Like my retelling of Rapunzel, one of the major points in that is when the prince gets blinded and goes around searching for Rapunzel singing. And he's searching. And I'll stop the story and say, look, if you ever have trouble finding yourself in a fairy tale, you you cannot tell me that you have never had something in your head that you were desperate to find somewhere else in the outside world. Mm. You cannot tell me that that you've not had that experience. And then I'll go right back into the story. So I'm, I'm literally stopping the story and deconstructing it and then inserting myself to remind the audience that we actually all have a relationship with this object, this old, old story that I'm telling, but I'm telling the story in a very postmodern contemporary way. So when I tell stories for children, I do much the same, but instead of pulling it apart to say something uh, aggressively poetic, I'm kind of pulling it apart to sort of play with them, to, in, to engage them in some sort of call and response or some sort of game or some, you know, just kid stuff, like stuff that makes kids excited about being at an event and then relating that to the story. I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a, a story that's actually a Kentucky folk tale that's about two kids at the foot of a cave and one kid dares the other one to go into the cave. And she's like, fine. And he didn't expect that. So then he says, no, 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 I'll go. So he goes down there, but he's scared because every time he says something, there's an echo back and he thinks it's a monster in the cave. Right. So I'll get the kids to start doing the echo. They become the echo and I'm just saying the thing and then they're echoing it and I'll get them to echo in that way. And then by the time we get to the end of the story, the little girl has gone down there and she's just having fun with the echoes because she knows it's just an echo. And when we get to the end of the set of stories, what I always do, especially if there are teachers there, because if you're doing children's entertainment at all, it is always very important to also entertain the teachers because they're the ones that pay your bills. Sure. They're the ones that actually book you. So when we get to the end of the set of stories, I do a piece where I say, if you put bad things out into the world, that is what echoes back. And if you put good things out into the world, that is what echoes back. And that is a thing that children can actually relate to and that children can actually hold on to, you know? And so, yeah, like over the course of a week, sometimes I will collect, you know, a paycheck from a corporate event and a storytelling festival that is, I mean, let's be real at many storytelling events, the average age of an audience member is 68, right? So I'll have that happening. I'll also do three children shows and I'll get like two or three, like, you know, colored pieces of paper of two kids in a cave from kids that really relate to what I'm trying to do. So it's, it's that kind of level of varied thing uh, with the folk and fairy tales. It is just as variable and just as malleable as when you have to do a, a stand-up set at the comedy zone in Johnson city versus having to do a college 
you can approach those the same way. Right. Yeah. So it's it's just like that, except the age the age ranges and the situations are, I would argue, even more variable. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, so let's back up a little bit then. What drew you to performing? Performing in general, yeah. I mean, you know, I was in Nashville, Run, and I was... Uh, and we knew each other a very little bit in Nashville because I was on my way out whenever you moved there, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we knew of each other. I don't know yeah. if we ever even crossed paths on the road, but we knew of each other. And you were headlining when I was still featuring. Yeah. So it was just like, are we going to get paired up? Which we ended up being paired up a couple times. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, you were on your way out when I got there. Yeah. So when I was in Nashville, when I first moved to Nashville, and this would have been like, I want to say, oh, five, four, oh, five, I don't know. But when I first got there, I wasn't doing stand up at all. I wasn't doing any performing. Um, I had moved there. My wife at the time had a job that moved us to Nashville. And I. Where were you at before it. Nashville? We were in Greensboro, North Carolina. Is that where you're from? Uh, no, that's where I went to college. Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, and in Greensboro, I had worked at a, a, the Barn Dinner Theater, where I was like the kitchen manager slash the backup Frank Sinatra impersonator occasionally. Like when the guy shouldn't couldn't show up, I would like go out and sing a thing because I went. So full disclosure, I went to school for vocal performance opera, and. The story is, and it's a actually true story. My dad said to me, you need to have a backup plan. You know, I was there on scholarship for opera, but dad was like, you need to have a backup plan. So I double majored in poetry. Very nice. Uh, yeah. Very nice. You, had, you, had, you had a lucrative backup. Yep. I always, I've stumbled backwards into everything and kind of not, what is it? The I've lived in the lap of poverty most of my life, which is pretty <laughs> great. But um, yeah, it's been, so then I, I was when I got this job as a kitchen manager, then they were like, Oh, you can sing. And I was like, well, yeah, but I don't really do that anymore. I kind of really burned out of being a musician in music school. And so then, but they would pay me extra to sing, you know, Frank Sinatra tunes. And I wouldn't even have to dress up. I would just be like, I'm just filling in for the guy that's supposed to be Frank Sinatra and would sing a couple of tunes and they'd pay me extra. And it was great. But then I was like, God, I don't want to do, I just didn't want to do that kind of work. That was not what I wanted to be doing. So when we moved to Nashville, I was like, I'm going to try to shop around some songs. And I started trying to do that. But that game is an interesting game. And really? as, uh, yeah, I mean, you had to have been the only guy doing that. <laughs> yeah, it was just me, which was weird. You know, I was a real innovator in that town. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and the other half of it, I mean, you were around during one of those shifts too. Right when I got there to Nashville, everything turned, the only thing anybody wanted to buy were songs that 13 year old girls would be into, you know? And that made sense, like considering like the, the beginning of the Taylor Swift thing and all of that, but it was just not what I do. So I just felt very out of place everywhere. And then Sean Parrott, do you know Sean? Of course. Yeah. Sean, Sean Parrott, Parrott, very funny Nashville comic. Yeah, Sean Parrott was a friend of mine in college. We went to college together and lived together, actually, my senior year, I think. And anyway, Sean was like, hey, man, I'm coming to Nashville. Let's go out to an open mic comedy night. And I was like, all right. So I went with him. And I was like, actually, I really dig this because it felt to me like a way that you could really sort of very openly express yourself, you know? And obviously when you're doing open mics, you don't realize like the difference between open mics and the rest of the comedy world. But, uh, but I really had a lovely time doing those open mics and kind of caught the bug. And that's how I ended up sort of on stage in the way that I do. So I've brought these other things like the, the, the guitar playing and the songwriting and the, and the poetry from those other worlds and they kind of caught up with me after I left stand up in this uh, in this new endeavor. Do you use the guitar and all your storytelling stuff? Not all of it, but I usually okay. but I usually, you know, I I try to do the smart thing as much as possible. If I have a 25 minute set in a storytelling thing, I try to do a little bit of everything I do. 
so that people don't misrep so I don't misrepresent myself to people meaning like on a marketing level on a branding level um I try to do a short little deconstructed folktale. I call them reupholstered folktales is what I call them. But like, and I'll try to do, you know, some of the sort of like tall alternative tales that I do. And then I'll play a song. So that way people see that I do more than one thing. So that it's just, you know, I'm ultimately hopefully more bookable. Yeah. I mean, that's, so what does it mean to you to be creatively fulfilled. Hmm. I mean, that's an ever changing, uh, that's a moving target. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, this new show I've got, it's called absurd it through the grapevine. It is definitely was not intended to be, but has turned into my midlife crisis show. Um, for sure. And I do think it's a lot right now. I'm really interested in, in finding, ways that I don't think an audience would have anticipated that we connect. I'm really interested in that question. What is, so instead of starting with like something that I know we are connected by, right? Like starting from a place of, uh, what is the word I'm trying to find? But like, like starting from that place where we are all, we all agree on the same thing and then kind of moving out from there. What I try to do right now, the, the challenge I'm setting for myself is to not let the listener know where we overlap yet. Hmm. And then, and then discover that over the course of the story so that then, you know, it feels more organic in that way. Um, so that has been that's been the project of late is really I'm really fascinated by those kinds of questions uh, as you know, in terms of like writing and performing. Well, so let's talk a little bit like just from a, I guess, from a sustainable standpoint about your evolution into mm-hmm. all of this, like because. I mean, my guess is, and this is just from, you know, knowing you some and and seeing your posts over the years, like, was it sort of, you were a stand up, then you started doing some fringe stuff, and then it just went to straight up storytelling. And and can you kind of unpack some of the details in there? Sure. I mean, I will say this, that it is not, it's, you know, it's a multi-spoke wheel, And so there are, you know, I'm making money from a lot of things as I go, you know, Um, but the standup is the only thing that I kind of left behind. I still do fringy stuff, uh, certainly in certain markets like Orlando um, is kind of a hybrid market for me and Cincinnati, which is, I live in Covington, Kentucky, which is just right across. So I call it the Jersey city of Cincinnati. It's like just across the river from Cincy. And, um, and then in Winnipeg, Alberta, uh, sorry, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada is like a big market for us and Calgary, Saskatoon and Edmonton. So we spend six to eight weeks every year in Canada doing French shows. So just to sort of break down the whole question. Um, I started out doing stand up in 2010. I made my first solo show, which was brighter shade of blue, which was all about my divorce. It was all the stuff I wanted to say at the Johnson city comedy zone, but did not think that was an appropriate space to sort of take the amount of time to try to build a non funny argument, right. In a comedy club. It's just not what I wanted to be doing. So I did that there and the show went really well. People really dug because I, I, I was funny enough that I think people thought it was entertaining, but I was also doing something that was a little different than stand up. And so I think people were drawn to that in the French world. Um, I did kind of a similar show in 2011 and then in 2012. And then what happened was in 2013, I had written this fictional thing as a novel that sucked as a novel. Like it was just not, didn't make any sense as a novel, but I took sections of it and that became ain't true and uncle faults, which is like the two primary characters that I use in my sort of alternative tales. 
So the 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 basically way it works uh, is my aunt Trinoco Falls live in a trailer park called Big Fib Trailer Park Cul de Sac. It's a trailer park in the shape of a giant cul de sac in a town called Big Fib. And I always say Big Fib is a very different town than the town I come from. The joke is I was born in a small Alabama town called Pensacola, Florida. And uh, and then Big Fib Trailer Park Cul de Sac is a very different trailer park than the trailer park I factually grew up pretty poor in. Also a fact, right? So that way the audience knows I'm not making fun of people who live in trailer parks, but I actually just relate a great deal to people who live in trailer parks because I, I did for 15 years, you know? So I go to Aunt True and Uncle Faults and then I tell you the story they told me. And that gives me a way into a lot of these old stories. So I'll tell Uncle False's version of Rapunzel. I'll tell Uncle False's version of whatever, right? That started in 2013. Um, and then I was doing, I, and then I met Erica McDonald, my partner, and she is a really great theater artist who does like meta theatrical, like performance art. Like she's not a storyteller and not a stand up. It's like, it's, you know, monologues, like theater, like solo theater. Probably even closer to what most people think of when they think of non stand up theater for solo artists is like what she does. Okay. Yeah. And she does a lot of directing. And so she and I were working on a project once. And then in 2016, we decided to completely branch out and we made a shadow puppet. She comes from the puppetry world. She, we made a shadow puppet ghost story show. Oh, nice. And that show won Best of Fest in Orlando and got picked up by the Soho Playhouse in New York. So we did an off-Broadway run of a show that we had no idea was going to be as as, as successful as it was uh, in, I think that was 2016 or 2017, and then toured that show around in 2018. Um, it was called 13 Dead Dreams of Eugene. And it was like a DIY shadow puppet ghost story play and had music in it and had, you know, it was just kind of everything that we were doing at that time. We kind of threw into that show and it just worked. It was just kind of a, an odd, lovely alchemy that just worked. And so that really got us into some other spaces, like into some other, like people were interested that were not as interested in just what I was doing from that show. And one of the things that happened was then I got the opportunity to kind of do some more theatrical stuff. And that's how people in the storytelling world saw me. Okay. So in 2017 or 2018, I was doing a show called balls of yarns, which is just, a, I mean, it's one of the weirdest shows I've ever made, but it was just like a lot of sort of dream logic, you know, there's a bartender who's who is a cactus whose name is Jeff Goldblum and he won't serve me water. Like it's one of those like kind of bizarre sort of shows that has all these concepts that sort of don't make sense for a long time. And then hopefully everybody comes on board. And that show did really well for us in 2017 and 2018 as well. And that's where I got, I got held over in Edmonton and then some storytelling people saw me and invited me to start doing some just proper storytelling festivals. Mm. And then once I started that process, I sort of realized if I'm going to do storytelling festivals, I got to be able to tell the kids. I got to have a decent repertoire of folk and fairy tales, but I don't want to tell them in the way that, you know, I think a lot of people think people tell folk and fairy tales. I want to do the sort of deconstructed thing that I do. So I've just been able to sort of move. I mean, I would love to say, Ron, that it's been intentional. You know, and it, like that, that I've like that I planned all of this out. But the fact is, I just kind of find a spoke and stick it into my wheel and then keep the wheel going and then find another spoke and stick into the wheel. And I just try to my best to stay in the center of that wheel. So I don't get thrown off. Yeah. But you, you found, you found all the right spokes though. Most people, uh, there's a lot of trial and error involved for, 
a lot of people. I'm not saying there wasn't any for you. I'm sure there was. There is for all of us. But um, but you've really kind of nailed it. It looks like. Yeah, it's good. I mean, you know, I, I, it's a I it's a really good life. I like what I'm doing, and I'm I'm making more money than I've ever made. Like I'm not, you know, whatever. We're all none of us are going to get rich at this. But like it is, uh, it's a comfortable life, and I get to just make things that I really want to make with, I think, less limited uh, contexts. I get, I think, I have more freedom to do the thing I want to do because of the diversification, and because my sort of primary four of my spokes are in the storytelling world, such that. Uh, I just have a lot more sort of freedom to swim around and, and, and try out things there. What have been some of the highlights for you in the storytelling space? And again, I'm asking this question as, as somebody who is still very fascinated by it all, but, but doesn't know a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, storytelling in, in America is an interesting thing. I feel like there's two spaces that people kind of see as story. There's like the traditional storytelling world, which is what I'm more a part of. And then there's kind of like the moth and all of what it has sort of spawned, right? Like the, the sort of personal narrative, contemporary, uh, often younger people doing like the moth stuff. And then the traditional world is often, um, like the age range kind of pushes a little further in the other direction. Uh, And so I feel like I've been very lucky to sort of be picked up by the traditional world because of the magical realism and because of like all of my own written work, like work that's not based on anything else is very fairy tale, like just very contemporary. Right. So, um, So I think that world has sort of found a place for me in it. And that is why I've been able to sort of, uh, to to navigate inside of that world. As far as highlights are concerned, I mean, obviously doing the national storytelling festival last year was crazy cool. I mean, it was just really, really, really great. Um, and it went really well. I mean, I, I have to say I was, I was really, I was, I could not have dreamed it would have gone as well as it did, you know, like it really, it was just a really nice fit. I did the Tempanogo storytelling festival in Utah, um, which is a huge festival and they have a 5,000 seat amphitheater with like jumbotrons. So you just like go on stage for 5,000 people and you're also like up on this big screen behind yourself. It's like the weirdest you just get to feel like Madonna for a second. It's like great. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. Um, and that was a big uh, win for me as well. Like being able to do temp uh, was a really cool thing. I've also just been, I'll tell you like, uh, just, I don't know if this is an answer to the question or if it's tangential, but working with people in the storytelling world has been re- really refreshing both on the teller side And on the, it's just less cutthroat in the traditional storytelling world than I compared to what? Mm, Certainly to stand up. I mean, I feel like, you know, people are battling for spots constantly and like there's, you know, there's all of that going on and it's really a lot more laid back in the storytelling world. I mean, everybody just kind of accepts that you will have a minute where you are kind of the flavor of the year and you're working a ton and that's kind of where I'm at this year. Like I'm really working a ton, but eventually, you know, sometime next year, two years from now, I will have a little bit less work from these like major festival places. And hopefully by then, if I've done it right, I will have parlayed that into some other work, like by way of schools and libraries and corporate gigs and things of that nature, I will have been able to use the exposure to my advantage. And then in, you know, hopefully for me in another year to three years, I will do all the major storytelling festivals again and we'll start the cycle over again. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like it's that, right. It's that world and that sort of viewpoint as opposed to like, get it all now, which is, I feel like a lot of, uh, 
certainly the the songwriting and the stand up world is it's a little bit more get it now. It's interesting you say that because uh, a project that I've done, I don't know if you saw it like on my social media or whatever, but I I did a uh, and I'm still trying to figure it all out. But uh, mm. I did a historic interpretation of Lucian the satirist. Yeah, where, similar to what you're talking about, I would take some of his texts and adapt it to like modern day, and I performed uh-huh. as him. But because he you know, he's basically considered the inventor of science fiction. Mm. So the whole concept was he traveled through time because he's this timeless guy and he, you know, and, and he's here to talk about some of his most prominent work. And I did a whole act as him. And I I feel like he has over 70 written works, so I'll never run out of material. And I don't, I don't read his material, but, but I read it. And then I think, okay, how can I make this into a story? How can I have a couple jokes? How can I make this digestible for people to learn more about this character in history who is, I think, often overlooked and also was a pretty complex character himself and in many ways wasn't a hero, which I explain Mm -hmm. throughout the presentation and I I break the fourth wall at the end. Um, And... So far, I've only done one Renaissance fair with it. I want to do more. I'm just trying to figure oh. out how to bring it to life. Yeah. And, um, but even in that one experience, it was just such less cutthroat was kind of the way, like there wasn't any of like, who's this guy? What's his deal? There was more like, whoa, who's this guy? What's his deal? Does that yeah. make sense? And was, and I yeah. I just felt like and I'm not saying like there wasn't a high bar or anything like that. I mean that they expect you to know your stuff and they expect but but everyone wants you to succeed and everyone wants you like it's just all about the craft, I feel like. Yeah. No, that's one can I I've got two things I want to just respond to. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah. One thing is, you know, I was referencing that um that children's story about the the cave and the echo. One of the things that I do, depending on how many adults are in the audience, is I will say as the little boy went down into the cave and he would go, what was that? What was that? And he would go on down into the cave. And when the little girl went down to the cave, she said, huh, I'm curious about what that is. Mm. I'll have to go look that up later. Right. And like it's a thing that kids can relate to sort of intellectually. But the adults actually, I think, really do sort of respond to it emotionally. Like we do have a bad habit of getting, I think, greedy with this, uh, with like fear. We're like, I want this now and someone else is going to get there before me. And there is this quality in that, that I think does exist in some, at least in some markets of stand up and, and certainly music as well. And when you're saying like, the it's all about the craft. I just really do think that generally speaking, I don't, I've been to a few Renaissance festivals, but certainly at storytelling festivals, a lot of the audience isn't sort of actively plotting about what they could do if they could replace you. (laughs) I think that's the most diplomatic and nice way I could say it. That's it. You know what I mean? I think yeah. there's a way in which they're like rooting for you because the audience is there to connect with you. They, you were put on the stage by the programmers because you are, your job is to find a connection with the audience. It's about that connection and the bridge between you and that listener. The, that is the craft So I just think there is a way in which, you know, it's not a more artful world than like the performance art theater world, but there is a way in which there is a more populist connection. There are like people who are just sitting there letting it wash over them. The, I'll say one more thing and then I'll stop rambling about this, but this is, this is one of my favorite things to discuss because it is exactly what I'm about these days is like how, do I make as much of a connection as possible with people in as alternative a way as possible? That's what I'm really trying to do is to, to keep storytelling weird 
right? That's what I'm about. And Erica has this gorgeous thing that she, she very quickly picked up on being somebody who was neither in the storytelling world nor in the stand-up world. Mm -hmm. She said to me one day, I feel like when we do stand-up, like when you do stand-up, people are there to forget their lives. And when you do storytelling, people are there to remember their lives. And I just think when you're there to forget your life, or if you're an industry person and you're there to sort of see what the competition's bringing, then it's a very different experience than if you're open to that person, that person up there has crafted something that is going to possibly give me a new way to reach an insight into my difficult relationship with my mom or whatever. There's a way in which that bridge, that craft, because the listener is more open, I think, they, they, then there is a lot less competitiveness and a lot less cynicism and a lot more sort of willingness to take a long ride to see where we end up at the end. I love that. that that's a really, that's a really cool way of uh, breaking it down. Well, so the last thing I want to ask you as we wrapped up here, you mentioned the traditional storytelling space and, and you mentioned that, you know, it is um, it, it is definitely of an older range. What do you think is the future for all of it then? I mean, do, do you think it will be passed down to a younger generation or, or will it eventually just be the moth style stuff or where do you think it's all going? Uh, I don't think there's any way to know, but I don't fear any of it because I don't think everybody says, oh, look around you know, I'm like the youngest, I'm one of the oldest guys on the fringe tour circuit. And I'm one of the youngest guys in the storytelling circuit. Right. It's like, I, I live in this I'm like, I'm sitting on the seesaw, like right in the middle of the seesaw is where I sit. And everybody's panicking. It feels like in the traditional storytelling world about the, the age of the audience, but everybody I've asked about what the age of the audience was 25 years ago. It was the same age. <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? It's like people don't remember that people get older and their lives change. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I am a guy, I'm 44 years old. I'm a guy who my, the, my outlook on the world has changed dramatically in 10 years and it's mm -hmm. going to change again. You know, like this idea that, uh, that this thing that has been around for ever, <laughs> Yeah, uh, is is then going to sort of like fade into nothing because of technology, man, if they were going to do that, it was already done it. Like we wouldn't even be having this conversation about my career right now. If that were the case, it, it will it look the same. Will there be like storytelling festivals in the same way that there are now? Uh, will it like I don't know. Right. I have no idea. But I do think that people have a need for stories that do not directly relate to them, mm -hmm. but indirectly relate to them. And I, and I think that is what folk and fairy tales and traditional tales and stories rooted in traditional tales actually provide. There's a way in which, and it's not to say this is not a criticism of personal narrative storytelling. I think, I mean, there's some great stuff out there and people do, and I get to, I mean, often when I'm on a festival, I'm booked next to somebody who's doing personal narrative work because I don't, mm -hmm. that's how that works. And the work is solid, but it's different on purpose, right? I am telling the stories I'm telling and I'm actively wanting you to see yourself in it which is, I think, a different stance than I'm telling you a story that happened to me. So when I'm telling a story that's actively happened to somebody else, but you can see yourself in it, let me just give you a quick example. Is that okay? I know we're running out of time, but is yeah. that cool? Yeah. I've got this piece and I'll, I'll just do, just tell like a little minute and a half uh, summation of it, synopsis. The reason why I think folk and fairy tales, fictional stories, absurd stories, surrealism, 
magical realism is super important. There was a, I got a friend named Liesl and she was telling me about her dad who had a friend in Europe and this guy owned a boat. And so he would on, when he had time off, he would take the tourists on this little two seater boat around the canals and through the tunnels. And I, it was romantic ostensibly, right? Like, and the joke I always say in the show is, uh, you know, paying somebody to have motion sickness and then be taken in a circle and dropped off where you started. Most of my romances were like that. Right. So, so the people sit in the boat, these two people come and they sit in the boat and they go and they, I guess they're from somewhere where there are no tunnels. I don't know, but uh, they go into a long tunnel and you can see the dime sized exit all the way at the end of the tunnel. And they're, and the boatman is doing his normal thing. And the people behind him start freaking out like freaking out, like stop that boat, stop that boat, you know? And he's like, what, what is wrong? What? And they're like, stop. This boat is too big to fit through the exit. Like this boat is way too big to fit through that hole at the end of the tunnel. And the boatman, he, he's like, no, I do this every day. Like what are you doing? And they're like, the, the boat. And they like, look like they're going to jump off the boat. And so the boatman just goes, no, 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 no. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. I have a friend who I pay to turn a crank that opens up the end of the tunnel. And then the two people just like sit down and they just enjoy the ride that they were going to enjoy one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. They get out and on the other side, the boatman gets out of the boat and pulls them out of the boat, helps them out of the boat and they tip him handsomely. And then as they're walking away, the boatman says, Hey, excuse me. Could you also spare a tip for my friend who turns the tunnel crank? Like, I think that's the, the question, right? These fictional stories, when those people sit down on the boat, calm, fictional stories are what helped me see how to get through. They help me see a way that I know I can get to the other side. And that is why I try to tell them, because I want people to be able to see themselves inside of these stories because I don't know anything more than you do except for this story. And that's why I want to tell it to you. Where can people go to learn more about you? Ain't true.com or talking Paul.com. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Paul, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Ron. This has been super fun, man. That was Paul Strickland. Check him out. Go see him if he's coming to a spot near you. Music for the 1000 Podcast is provided by Andrew Saxena. Be sure to check out his podcast, the Baywatching Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And leave us a five-star review, would you? This is still a new project. If you leave us a five-star review, it really helps the algorithm. So please leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to support this show on the sustainability end, you can do so over at patreon.com slash romplacone. For a give what you can level, you get all kinds of exclusive content. You get the episodes before they're released everywhere else. You get a bonus podcast between Drew and myself. There are screenings and private events for patrons only pertaining to my films and other projects. There's full stand-up clips not available anywhere else. I'll make you a theme song, and that's all for a give what you can level. Even a dollar a month goes a long way. All right, we have reached another round number, 40. Have we surpassed my birthdays? I don't know. But we have episode 40. I, I feel like that that's that's another milestone. That, am I going to say that every 10 numbers? I'm going to be like, well, it's 50 now. What do we think of this? I don't know. You'll have to tune in next week to find out. This is a journey. See you next week. Hey, guys. Ron Placone here. Take your own 1,000 challenge. No, you don't need to interview 1,000 people, although if you want to do that, go for it. Your 1,000 challenge can be whatever you want. Maybe you want to call a friend out of the blue once a week. Maybe you want to read a book every month. Maybe you want to start a different garden every season. I guess that might be dependent on where you live. Look, the point of the challenge is taking on an endeavor that enriches your life in some way, and it can be measured. And then, of course, you do it regularly. That's what 1000 is doing for me and hopefully for you too. The main reason for this podcast and every podcast I've ever done is to build community. So take your own challenge. Then join our Facebook group. It's called 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. That's 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. And post about what your 1000 challenge is and the progress you're making. 
All I ask is that people be encouraging of each other's challenges. This is personal and vulnerable, so be cool. There's enough negativity on social media. We don't need to add to it. For those of you who aren't on Facebook, hopefully in the future we'll be expanding to places like Discord, Reddit. But for now, we're starting on Facebook. And again, that Facebook group is called 1000 What's Your Challenge? See you there.